Welcome to lecture number 21 for ECE 376 Embedded Systems. Timer 0, 1, 2, and 3 interrupts. Now, at the start of the semester, we had a microprocessor that could only do one thing at a time. You could drive the LCD display, or you could measure time, or you could output a precise frequency, like play note A4. You couldn't do two things at once. Once we introduce timer 2 interrupts, then you're suddenly able to do two things at once. You can Who's had a guest visitor for Momo? You can output a precise time using timer 2, or you can output a precise frequency using timer 2, and the main routine can drive the LCD, read the push buttons, and so on. With timer 0, 1, 2, and 3 interrupts, you can actually do five things at the same time. I've got four different interrupts, each one can do something different, plus I've got the main routine. Now this can get rather confusing having five things running at the same time, but it does make a, a few problems much, much easier to solve. So as a little bit of background, uh, the four timer interrupts, timer 0 through 3, are set up as follows. Each one interrupts after every n clocks. Uh, timer 0, 1, and 3 can be either the external event or the clock running at 10 MHz. For each interrupt, I need to set the conditions for the interrupt. That's interrupt every n clocks. Uh, timer 0, 1, and 3 use a prescaler times their timer. Timer 2 uses a times b times c. And each interrupt you have to turn on, turn on, really turn on, honestly turn on, then globally turn on to get them to work. And each one has a corresponding flag that's set when the interrupt is triggered. To illustrate that, I'm going to go through a couple of different programs. The first one is called Chord. What Chord does is it does five things at once. I've got timer 0 interrupt playing a specific note, either A3, B3, or C4. Timer 1 interrupt controlling port C pin 1. Uh, that will output the note C4, D4, or E4. Timer 3 interrupt output three different notes. So each of these are basically running it independently, outputting a precise frequency. Timer 2 monitors the push buttons and uh, sets up which notes you could be playing. That's monitored every millisecond. Plus you've got the main routine. The main routine will be displaying the uh, number of clocks between interrupts for timer 0, 1, and 2. So that's five things at the same time. The first thing you need to know for the timer 0, 1, and 3 is how many clocks do I need between interrupts? That's just calculated as 10 million divided by 2 divided by the frequency. Gives you these numbers. For timer 2, I want timer 2 to run every millisecond, which means n is 10,000. No, we've already done that. That just means a is 10, b is 250, c is 4. Uh, the next step, I need to set up the hardware. I need to combine three different frequencies. An easy way to do that in hardware is just take the average of the three voltages. I'm going to take the three uh, output voltages time together through a 250 ohm resistor and take that to the 8 ohm speaker. This point is almost ground because the 8 is so much smaller than 250. Treat that like a ground. The current from RC0 comes in plus RC1 plus RC2. Those three currents sum together and go to the speaker. That's a hardware solution. If I want to do that with a single output pin, that's really, really hard. But three out different output pins, each of these will be different frequency. This is a hardware solution to sum them all together, and I'll be combining three frequencies at the speaker. Now, in terms of software, I want to set up four different interrupts running at the same time. This is just for your uh, convenience. This is a set of constants defining A3 to A4. Where these numbers come from is the table that I set up before. That's the number of clocks between the interrupts. Inside the interrupt surface routine, I've got four interrupts running. If timer 0 kicks in, I'll set timer 0 equal to a global variable n0, and if any buttons push, toggle RC0. Timer 1 toggles RC1. Timer 3 toggles RC2. And then timer 2. Timer 2 watches the push buttons. If a millisecond, it checks which button's being pushed and sets n0, n1, and n3 accordingly. Uh, each of these has to be turned on for the prescaler 1. 
and then the main routine just displays what's happening. Now to illustrate this or show you what's happening, um, here I've got the pick board, three resistors in parallel going to a speaker, and then this is showing what's happening on port C pin 0 and port C pin 1. This is the U book uh, and the oscilloscope I just got off of Amazon that I really, really like. Highly recommend. If I hit RC, RB0, you can hear the note. That's a chord. I've got three notes playing at the same time. On the oscilloscope, I can show you two of the notes. This is 261 hertz and 219 hertz. Hit RB2. So that's a chord, playing three notes at the same time. Also the LCD display is just showing what is your N0, N1, and N3. Now the significance of this program is I actually have five things going on at the same time. I've got the main routine, just displaying what's happening. I've got each interrupt. Each interrupt controls a different pin, interrupting at a different uh, frequency. The interrupts do not affect each other. I can have timer zero running at, in this case, playing note A3, uh, timer 1 playing note B3, no, C4, and timer 3 playing note E4. Again, they have no impact on each other whatsoever. Plus, in addition, I've got timer 2 running every millisecond. So that's one example with timer 0, 1, 2, and 3. I can actually have essentially four programs running in parallel. A second example of what you can do. This is a quadcopter controller. A lot of RC cars use the same formatting. I've got this controller right here. These three pot wires, the blue ones, go to your motor. This is a three-phase AC synchronous motor, a quadcopter motor. To power it, I've got the 5 volts power and ground. That comes from your lithium batteries. Or, in our case, it's going to be a little power supply. Then you've got the control line. These three thin wires. The thin wires, you know, is a control line because, being thin, they can't carry current. This controls the command signal. What the command signal looks like is the black wire is ground, red wire is 5 volts, and the white one is your signal. To control the speed of a quadcopter, and actually most RC uh, aircraft use this formatting, to control them I need to output a pulse at 50 hertz. The width of the pulse is the command. 0.9 milliseconds is idle, 2 milliseconds is full on, full speed. So what I need to do is generate a signal that goes between 0.9 milliseconds and 2 milliseconds at a frequency of 50 hertz. Now here the point behind the program is to show you that interrupts can change the conditions of interrupts. Again, kind of confusing, but if you figure it out it's actually really useful. So here's what the waveform looks like. This is what controls the quadcopter. It's a 50 hertz waveform. That's the time between rising edges. If I zoom in, you can see the pulse width. If it RB0, this is idle, a 0.9 millisecond pulse. That's 500 microseconds per division, a little bit less than two divisions. Uh, that'd be one millisecond. As I hit the different buttons, I increase the pulse width. And 0.9, that's the power up, that turns off. 1.2 milliseconds is low speed. And then at the other extreme, uh, 2 milliseconds, or in this case it looks like, so 5, 10, 15, 18 milliseconds is high speed. That's the pulse width modulation. I'd like to be able to do that using timer interrupts, precisely control the pulse width and the frequency. So here's how you do that. I've got the two different interrupts running, timer 0 and timer 1. What timer 0 does is it sets port C pin 0. Timer 1 then clears it. Timer 0 is set up so it kicks in every 20 milliseconds, giving you a 50 hertz signal. In addition, timer 0 sets the condition for timer 1. If I want to be idled, when timer 0 kicks in, it sets up a timer 1 to interrupt 0.9 milliseconds later, or at full speed, sets up the timer 1 interrupt 2 milliseconds later. So here the interrupt is setting up the condition for the interrupt. 
by doing that, I get this type of function, the pulse width. So again, the rising edge is timer 0, the falling edge is timer 1. So here I've got actually three routines running at the same time. The main routine, timer 0, timer 1. Timer 0 has a prescaler of 4, so that every 4 times 50,000, 200,000 clocks, or 20 milliseconds later, timer 0 kicks in. When it kicks in, it turns on RC0, and sets up timer 1 for end clocks in the future. Timer 1 then clears RC0, that's this time, and the main routine sets in. This says I want to have a 0.9 millisecond pulse, 1.2, all the way up to 1.8 milliseconds. And that's what you see here. That's 1.8 milliseconds. Long beep says the voltage is correct. The 0.9 millisecond 50 hertz pulse is correct. It's on idle mode. If I now give it a longer pulse, 1.3 milliseconds, it starts spinning. 1.4, 1.5. This is point 0.9. Here's another example of what you can do with multiple interrupts, a frequency counter. Now, frequency is measured as cycles per second, so if I have two interrupts, one measuring cycles, one measuring seconds, I can take the ratio and get cycles per second, or hertz. So to do that, let's use two different interrupts. I'll have timer 0, interrupt every one second. Timer 1 counts edges. So if I look at the number of edges in one second, I've got cycles per second, or hertz. Now the reason you might want to do this are, you know, many. A common one is an optical encoder. This goes on the shaft of a DC motor. It's got all these little notches in there. As it rotates going around, I generate a square wave. By measuring the frequency of the square wave, I can tell you how fast I'm spinning. For example, the ones in the lab, those motors have 100 pulses per rotation. So if I count the cycles per second, or edges per second, I know how fast the motor is spinning. So to do that, let's set up two different timers. Timer 0 will interrupt every one second. That's 10 million clocks. That's too big for a 16-bit counter, so I'll add a prescaler. The prescaler is 256, which means that 256 times 39,250 gives me 10 million, or pretty close to 10 million. So timer 0 kicks in every second. Timer 1 actually doesn't do anything. Timer 1 measures external events. What that does is every time I see an edge, I'll just count on timer 1. And then if I just take the current count minus the previous count, I'll have edges in one second, or hertz. Timer 2 just generates a 500 hertz square wave just to give us something to measure. So timer 2 is set up for 1 millisecond. Uh, toggles every interrupt, then I'll get a 500 hertz signal, like you see here on the screen. The initialization is timer 0 is set up for prescalers 256. Timer 1 is set up for external uh, input. That's timer 1 source select is external. And then timer 2 is just 1 kilohertz. Put that all together, and this is what you see. That looks like it's stuck in the corner. What I have here is a 500 hertz square wave. If you look on the LCD display, it shows that I'm counting 1,005 clocks, or the hertz, 1,005 edges every second. So that's one way to measure frequency, cycles per second. Another way to measure frequency is seconds per cycle. It depends upon the frequency that you're measuring. If I have a low frequency square wave, this is actually more accurate. For example, if I have a 1 kilohertz square wave, in one second I'll see 1,000 edges. So that gives you a resolution of one part in 1,000. If I measure the clocks between edges, however, I've got 1 millisecond between edges at 10 megahertz. That's 10 milli or 10,000 clocks. So actually, it's more accurate to measure seconds per cycle than cycles per second at 1 kilohertz. Depends upon the frequency you're looking at. But at low frequencies, the period is more accurate to measure. High frequencies, it's the cycles per second, or hertz, is more accurate. Uh, plus the advantage is if I measure the time between edges, I get a reading every millisecond, every edge.
just a different way of doing it. One reason you might want to do that are these little DC motors. Uh, this DC motor has three wires. There's red is power, black is ground, and blue is the tachometer output. If you connect that to a 1K resistor to power, I get a square wave out like this. By measuring the time between edges, I can tell you the period, um, or like we did before, cycles per second, except the frequency is only 33 hertz. If I measure the edges per second, I only have a resolution one part in 33. If, on the other hand, I measure the time between edges, the time between edges it will be much more accurate. So here's what I'm going to do. To measure the time between edges, I'll have timer 0 measure time to 1 clock. Timer 1 is external event. It interrupts every edge. That's why I have timer 1 equal to minus 1. Uh, you can't do that when you have this as a time or measuring the clock. I can't interrupt every clock, but I can interrupt every edge, especially when the edges come at 33 hertz. I'll then measure the current time of the edge. Uh, remember the previous time of the edge. And the difference between the two is the number of clocks between edges. And timer 2 just gives you one kilohertz test signal to see if something to measure. What that looks like is this. I've got the motor spinning. That produces a square wave. The time between edges is 30.031 something 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 seconds. So I've got the period with a resolution of one part in 300,000. So this is actually a very accurate measurement of the period. The reason it's fluctuating is the encoder isn't exactly perfect. Uh, as the teeth go by, sometimes the time... Okay, so here's what it looks like. I've got the motor spinning. The blue wire produces a pulse every rotation. That's what you're seeing here. As I slow down the motor, pulses get longer. To measure the speed, I'll use the interrupts. On the LCD display, you can see it. That's the number of clocks between interrupts. So here, it's 33 milliseconds between edges. As I slow it down, the period gets longer. It's now 7,800 milliseconds between edges. That's another way to measure speed, but notice again, I'm getting actually 30 updates per second, or 28 updates per second, 20 hertz, and my resolution is one part in 331,000 something, something, something. So here's another program that uses multiple interrupts, pulse width modulation. Now we looked at pulse width modulation with timer 2. Here I'm going to use pulse width modulation with timer 0 and timer 1. Uh, what I want is pulse width modulation at 1 kilohertz, and I want to be able to vary the pulse width. For example, here on the oscilloscope, as I hit the different buttons, notice that the width is changing. That's the pulse width modulation. In addition, it's every 1 millisecond, or 1 kilohertz, actually 998 hertz. So how do I do that with interrupts? Well, what I'm going to do is set up timer 0 every millisecond. When timer 0 kicks in, it sets. Timer 0 also sets up timer 1 interrupt anywhere between 0.01 and 0.99 milliseconds later. So when timer 1 kicks in, it'll clear. And that's what you're seeing over here on the oscilloscope. Timer 0 is sets. That's this point, the rising edge. Timer 1 is the falling edge. If timer 1 happens right after timer 0, I get a short pulse. As it happens later and later, I get a longer pulse. Then if it's at 0.99 milliseconds later, it's almost 100% on. Now the reason to do that is I can make a binary output look like analog using pulse width modulation. And if you look at the LEDs, that's on port C, here the LEDs are very, very dim. As you get a wider pulse width, that's 30%, 40% on. It looks like I've got an analog output. Actually, it's binary. It's turning on and off. So if you look really fast, it actually is flashing. You can see the flashing on an oscilloscope.
So to get that to work, I've got three routines running at the same time. I've got timer zero kicks in. It sets up the next timer zero interrupt one millisecond in the future. It sets up timer one interrupt anywhere between 100 and 90 to 100 clocks in the future. And sets RC0. Timer one then kicks in anywhere between 100 to 90 to 900 clocks later and clears RC0. And the main routine checks the push button. Based upon the button that you push, I change PWM, which changes when timer 0 sets up timer 1, changes the pulse width, and also displays the time and the pulse width. So again, this is what you see. As I hit the buttons, I go from almost nothing on to almost 100% on. Uh, so again, I've got multiple interrupts happening at the same time. That's kind of the advantage of having timer 0, timer 1, timer 2, timer 3 in the main routine. With four interrupts, I can actually do five things at the same time. It can get really confusing, but if you can figure it out, I can do some fairly complicated tasks actually fairly easily, like having a variable pulse width, having a pulse width at 50 hertz, say for quadcopter controller, or playing a chord, playing four notes at the same time. So that's kind of a wrap up of timer zero through timer three interrupts. Uh, timers are really, really useful. And hence, the pick has four different timer interrupts. So that's timer zero, one, two, three interrupts. Lecture number 21 for ECE 376 Embedded Systems.